In my previous experiment, rocket power, I created a system here that uses the thermal energy from rockets to run either a steam turbine or an oil refinery down here. And I transferred the thermal energy from this hot side to the cool side via ethanol heating loops or cooling loops. And many of you asked a good question, and that is what happens if we get rid of that heating loop that you have going on there and just have a connection between the hot side and the cold side right next to each other. And in this arrangement here, you could put a steam turbine right here and take the thermal energy from both of these sides to run that unit. And if the shoe fits, I say use it. However, there's something else going on here that might look a little bit familiar. If you were to look inside your computer today, there's a good chance you would see something like this. And what this is is a radiator that's connected to a heat block down there and the thermal energy runs through these things called heat pipes. So how does a heat pipe actually work? Well, there's a liquid contained inside of this pipe itself and there's a wick on the outside. And there's a property that when you go from a liquid to a gas, it's called latent heat. A certain amount of energy is actually used there to make that happen. But what happens is you, you end up with this moving system down here that's moving thermal energy very, very efficiently from one end to the other. So you can take a concentrated spot of heat and dissipate it over a very large area efficiently. And that's what we're seeing in many of these designs right here. Well, that's great, but we have highly conductive materials, so why doesn't the heat just travel through the fin itself? Well, that's because there's two major things at play here. The area, which is the space that that energy has to travel through, it's usually not going to be very big because you're trying to maximize the surface area to the air and therefore radiate a bunch of heat. So A is a big factor in this equation. The other big factor here that's even bigger is the distance. So it's how big of a space do you have and how far does it have to travel through. So notice the one thing I mentioned about a heat pipe, and that is the fact that it actually has movement inside of it. So because it has movement inside of it, we're able to really get around the whole distance problem. And if we look back at our system here, guess what? It's moving. And because a system like this is moving, it ends up being far more effective at transferring thermal energy from one spot to another. Now, while all of this sounds really fancy and cool and you just thought you were playing a video game, but now you're actually learning something, it doesn't mean anything if we don't actually test the theory. So right down here, I've set up this experiment. Now this experiment, I've worked really hard to try to make it be as controlled as possible. It's not a very exciting experiment though, um, because all we're doing is moving 1000 degree stuff over here, which contains like a million kilograms of steam. It's just a very high mass and it has lots of energy inside of it. And then over here on the right, I have 100 degrees of 2000 kilograms of steam plus the mass of the window tiles that are around it. And what I have set up here is an apples to apples comparison of using several different gases and liquids to run through this unit to see just how quickly it heats up the mass on the right. So in this experiment, I seeded everything at 100 degrees Celsius. Now, the reason I did 100 degrees Celsius is because I wanted to test both steam and water and because of the way the game works, you have to go above or below several degrees in order to actually get that phase change. So that allowed me to pick the right temperature for the working liquids or gases, which again is another thing that designers of heat pipes actually have to consider. What is the working fluids and what are the working temperatures? And the temperatures we're working with today range from 100 degrees Celsius up to 1000. So with that in mind, I've tested hydrogen, steam, ethanol, oxygen, uh, thermium in the form of a solid moving through a conveyor, diamond in the form of solid, water liquid at one kilogram packets, petroleum and supercoolant, both of those at one kilogram as, as well. So when we go to run the test, here's what I do. I flip the switch on and it's going to start to fill everything as need be. And we're also going to do this number right here so that everything moves into position. So you can see the gas is going to move up into its spots right there, but it won't continue around the loop. So it's just going to stay like that. Same thing is happening here with the liquids. Now there's one trick with the liquids here, and that is if it's one kilogram or below, it doesn't phase change within the pipe in the current build of the game. And we're just a few days away from the official launch of the game, so maybe that'll just stick around. The automation I'm using to make sure that I only end up with one kilogram in this, in this loop is I have a liquid pipe thermal sensor right here to a knot gate hooked up to a liquid shutoff right here. And what I'll use to throttle that down is I'm going to use the flow control right down here and set that to one kilogram. 
This liquid valve just runs max out. It's just giving the whole loop a direction. That's how we get movement in our systems rather than you know fancy physics in a, a heat pipe. So to run this, I just go down here. I set all of these valves to the maximum. And then for this one, I set it to 1000 and just repeat that for everything. And then I flip that automated signal right there and that is going to enable the conveyor shutoff so that it continues to flow around and around with solids on its conveyor. The last thing I need to do is just build a window tile right here, again made of diamond, and that will bridge this connection, um, allowing the thermal energy to move from the hot side to the cold side. So here it is in motion. You can see that the gas is flowing in, same with the liquid and the conveyors. And you can see that the temperatures that we're dealing with right now, uh, let's say we take a look at this conveyor, it's at 956 degrees Celsius right there. So it's coming out of this area quite hot. And as we look at this tile over here, we'll see that the temperature starts to increase. The same sort of thing is happening here as it, the heat is traveling through these tiles. So 730 degrees Celsius, and then it kind of drops down a little bit further and further as we move off to the right. So the distance here is 10, and that's really important uh, to keep in mind because, again, as I mentioned with the equation before, distance plays a major uh, factor when we consider how much energy can move from one side to the other. Now, because this thing is continuously moving, it's really important to realize that the distance between this tile and this tile is virtually zero because the heat energy inside of this pipe really isn't going anywhere. It's not trying to move from one tile to the next, it's just being conveyed. So now that you get to the really, really boring part here. So essentially what I did here is let this run for uh, a couple hours and then actually recorded at what moments the different sensors here, the output sensors went from red to green. So I took temperatures, um, as you can see right down here, this one is at 200 degrees, then it's 300, 400, 500, and 600 degrees Celsius, just to see what that chart looks like. So I recorded the screen and went back and recorded all of the different data points here, just like so, it took a little while. All right, so after I gathered all of these data points, I threw it into a sweet graph for you. So this is basically time in seconds over here, and then with temperature to the right. Now the importance here isn't necessarily how much time it took because this is a unique setup, it's just an experiment and the temperatures are whatever, right? But the slope, the slope of these lines is really important because it shows just how efficient that temperature is moving from one side to the other. And the thing that I was most interested here, besides the question that people were asking, which was, you know, how effective is it to actually just create a stem of solid diamond or something like that to move temperature? But am I using the right gas in this situation? Should I be using steam if that's available and I can get it to work over ethanol? So that's the other thing I was actually curious about. And this test here will prove that I actually made a mistake. So the results from best to worst are as followed. Thermium works the best. As you could imagine, it has the highest specific heat capacity at 20 kilogram packets per spot as it's moving around. And it also is very thermally conductive as well. So nothing can compete with thermium, although diamond is not far behind. So diamond being much more available is something that you should definitely look at for moving heat from one spot to another. Although the rails can be rather expensive. Just behind that is liquid supercoolant, which is very impressive when you consider that it's moving one kilogram packets. However, if you can move 10 kilogram packets, uh, you can actually move a lot more thermal energy using the uh, supercoolant but it has to be within the working temperature. And since we're going from 1000 degrees Celsius, we get above the working temperature of the liquid. Now, just above that is gas in the form of steam and then water in the form of liquid. And they both perform basically identically. Now, the reason for that is because they have an identical specific heat capacity. So you can see here, water has a specific heat capacity of 4.1 and steam, because it's just hot water, <laughs> still has that 4.1 specific heat capacity, although its thermal conductivity is lower. So you can see in this example here that the thermal conductivity of the material isn't really playing a major factor at all. It's really all of the specific heat capacity. And then when you compare that to, you know, the super coolant, you can see that that's 8.4. Now diamond and thermium both have a lower specific heat capacity, but again, they're making up that difference with the increased amount of mass. Looking back at the chart here, we start to get into 
everybody else. So hydrogen, solid diamond, as in just one spot to the next, and gas ethanol all performed relatively similar. So you can see in this chart here, the orange is going to be our hydrogen, the blue is the solid diamond, and the yellow is ethanol. So then just above that, a very common liquid that we use for doing work such as this when we don't have other liquids available in this temperature range is petroleum. And you can see how that actually performed, uh, performed all right, I guess. However, it never actually reached 600 degrees. So our worst performer here was oxygen and it only ever reached uh, 400 degrees after a little over an hour of testing. So what did I learn from this experiment right here? Well, solid conveyors have a serious advantage because they're moving 20 kilogram chunks from one spot to the other. And it isn't just diamond or thermium that I can use. There's other solids as well, if they're within the working temperatures of what I have going on here. And depending on what our rockets are doing, we might actually see temperatures that are hot enough to melt most solids that we can throw into that conveyor. And you might be able to use that to your advantage. Interesting stuff. Super cool and it's super amazing. And if you're going to deal with temperatures that are always above that 100 degrees Celsius to the sky's the limit, you know what? Steam would be a better choice than ethanol, at least in this sort of arrangement. So now we have a better understanding of materials and how they're actually moving thermal energy from one side to the other. However, the other half of the equation here is just the physical arrangement. And I feel like that's the other half of what the, these questions we're asking is, you know, is it really worth doing the whole loop thing or can I just take this and put it right down here and just have this tile touch that tile and conduct the energy through that? Well, let's do a side-by-side -side comparison to see how that actually plays out. Okay, so this time I'm going to change up the experiment a little bit. And rather than working between two really, really hot temperatures because it's hard to visual, visually see, we'll start with 1000 degrees over here, just like last time, and then move it to several tiles that are going to be cooler to see just how quickly that heat travels along the cord of our window tiles. Okay, so here's how this test is going to play out. On the top left, I'm going to be using solid diamond. We're going to see how this temperature progresses along this cord of diamond window tiles over here. Same sort of window tiles are in this spot over here starting at the same temperature, but this time we're using one kilogram packets of liquid water. On the bottom left, we're going to be using hydrogen because that's the only gas I have available in these temperature ranges. And then in the bottom right, I'll be conveying uh, diamond packets on a solid conveyor. Let's see what happens here. See, there was a problem right there. The stupid bridge. <laughs> uh, all right, that makes sense. Try again, conveyorness, and ship this conveyor around in a vacuum so that it doesn't corrupt the tiles that it's passing over. Wait, how did that how did that heat up? Oh, but it's not down here. What? Did I just learn something about the conveyor rail that I didn't know? Is it? It's actually, huh? Heat is going from here to here, even though they're not touching. They're not on top of each other. The things you learn when you run crazy experiments. All right, all right, so there we go. I destroyed some stuff and now everything is at the same temperature we'll be able to get a nice comparison. Okay, so I'm going to set this to 1000, set that to maximum and flip this switch on and this will start conveying the materials around. Now I'm going to let this run until the materials get to this point right here. Okay, so at that point, I'm going to go over here, bridge this up so everything starts at the exact same time. Or bring it on close to it. Okay, so here we go. Let's see how this works. So you can see the heat is very quickly traveling up here on the top left. But the real question is, how is this going to progress over time? So it's 600 degrees at its hottest point right there. And down here, we're coming up on 600 degrees. We're only at 200 and some there. We're also at 200 and some there. But as this plays out, notice what happens with the temperature that is going to be back here. This heat, because it's on a conveyor, is going to be carried further down the cord, spreading that heat out more efficiently. Okay, so once this gets to 22 degrees uh, at the very end of the cord, here we go. Let's take a look at what all has happened here. So down here using hydrogen, you can see that we're at 397 
and we're only at 20.1 at the beginning and end of that unit right there. With the diamond conveyor, we're at 859 and we're at 43 degrees on the end. Down here, we're 582 and 24.6. Whereas the solid um, conductor, which is just going to be the diamond right here, we're at 714 and 22.2. .2. So the thing that I've noticed right there, obviously, is that the diamond works fantastic. Um, but when we compare the liquid to the solid over here, the temperature is higher at the end than it is with just the solid conductor, but the range across the entire unit is less than what we have over here with the diamond. Now the reason is because it has to move from one tile to the next to the next to the next in order for that heat to transfer. Whereas the liquid is giving off as much thermal energy as it can, but then it moves to the next tile and then that recalculation happens. So not only is it calculating how hot is this tile and that tile, it's also calculating what the remainder of that water is as it's moving from one spot to the next. So it's really pushing that heat along. So a more interesting number might be, what is this spot right here? Because it's more or less in the middle of our arrangement. So you can see we're at 80 degrees with the solid diamond. At the liquid, we're at 94.5. Um, with the solid conveyor with diamond inside of it, we're at 239 degrees, showing you just how amazing that is. And then over here, conveying the with the hydrogen around, we're actually only at 54.3. So I feel like this was a good example, um, you know, between a solid conductor and an equivalent moving conductor like this one over here. And then our best option or our best reasonable option compared to the solid unit over there and how, how much better that unit actually is at just moving the heat through it. But it also shows that the solid conductor still has an advantage over an inferior um, medium, which is this gas right down here, hydrogen. Okay, so in one last example here, what if we use multiple methods together? So in the top right here, I'm moving water. I'm also running a solid diamond conveyor, and that's going to be compared to just a standard solid connection over here on the left. Now take a look at how this changes. Do, 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 do. Okay, so you can see here, obviously the heat is moving in, but the heat over here is also moving at, in both directions. So you can definitely combine multiple methods together in order to solve your problem. So you can see we got 600 some there, you got 200 and some there. Shoot, you can even say, hey, guess what? Sometimes I'll have a solid connection down here. And yeah, you can move a lot of heat from one spot to the other using the conveyors as needed and the solid connections where possible. So you can see here, a hybrid-like solution allows you to tackle many more problems than just relying on one method or the other. And that is very much what we end up doing in the real world. So when we take a fresh look at this arrangement up here, we do see that there is some opportunities for improvements. If this was just a couple tiles higher, it could be in direct contact with this very hot window tile right there, increasing its thermal conductivity. But that's only if the arrangement fits the situation. Um, however, heat loops here also will allow us to take that thermal energy and push it to the far side of our radiator, which is exactly what we end up doing in real life. So we have a nice big heatsink that's in contact with something like our CPU, but we're also using those heat pipes to move it further away. Ultimately, heat loops like this allow us to tackle more complex problems and make more efficient use of the real estate we have. So to answer the final question here of why didn't I design this in the most simplest manner uh, possible, which is just to stick it right next to that and call it good. Well, personally, I try to make videos that hopefully you find informative or inspirational. And necessarily the, the easiest way is not always the most educational way. So hopefully you guys found this video somewhat informative or educational. And if this looks like the channel for you, maybe considering that subscribe button. As always guys, stay awesome. Peace. Brothgar out.